and other people were, as we would say, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, I was just reading the, the account of it in Acts. And I was thinking to myself, we read that and we're just like, wow, can you imagine that? Can you imagine what happened? And then the Holy Spirit reminded me that he's with us all the time. We think that was awesome because it was this event that happened where tongues of fire and speaking in tongues. But for us, because Jesus has now gone to sit at the right hand of God, he sent the Holy Spirit. And for us, that's something that maybe we sometimes take for granted. Do you know what I mean? That, that occurrence that happened at Pentecost is with us all the time. It's with us all of the time. And I was just reading it and I was thinking, how crazy is it that that same Holy Spirit that was in the upper room is in this room now? He's here. He's inside of us. He's not like outside waiting for us to invite him in. You know, he's not lying dormant somewhere, but he's as powerful. He's as on fire as he was on that day in Pentecost. And it, I was just standing there thinking, that's crazy. That is crazy. That is inside each and every one of us. We walk around with that power inside of us. So I just thought, oh, I just wanted to say that. So anyway, do you know, um, before we start the service, I just want to pray. And Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you have poured out your spirit onto us, that we do have the spirit of God living inside of us. I thank you that we, if we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have all of the power that we need to live this life. There's nothing in this life that we can't overcome, not a single thing when we draw on the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that you did not leave us on our own, that we're not on our own, that as we sang, that you go before us, you're behind us, you're all around us. Your Holy Spirit walks in step with us, you walk in step with us, the Lord Jesus walks in step with us, that we're never on our own, we're never at a loss, there's never not an answer that you've actually provided everything. And I thank you, God, that you didn't make it difficult, that you gave us your word and you told us how to draw on that power. You told us that we are your children, that it belongs to us, and that when we have faith and we speak out words of faith, that that power comes up from inside of us. And it's not only visible to us, but it's visible to all those around us. And I thank you that Pentecost wasn't just a day, that we live in a continual state of Pentecost, tongues of fire on our heads, words of tongues coming out of our mouths, the Holy Spirit stirring within us. That same thing that took place then takes place in us every single day. It's ongoing. We thank you that you are continually filling us up with your joy, with your love, with your peace, with your power. And we thank you that today, as we listen to whatever is spoken by whoever stands up here or whatever conversations we have just in this room, I just ask that you will remind us that nothing is insignificant, nothing is small, that if we look around and think, oh, but this church isn't huge, there's not lots of people here yet, that we actually remember that God needs one person, one person to turn the whole world around. Jesus was a man and he turned the world around. He was the son of God, I know that, but he turned the world around, a human being in the flesh. And then 12 disciples continued that. So Father, I just ask you to remind us, nothing is small, nothing is insignificant, no conversation is without you, that you speak through all of us and that you can change our lives just at one word, one word from you can change our lives, the whole direction of our lives. So we thank you that today is a good day. Today is your day. We thank you that you have preordained for every single one of us good works to walk into. And that as we follow the leading of your Holy Spirit, that we will walk into those good works, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of others. Because those good works include telling people that there is a God that loves them and there is a way and they don't have to be stuck in what they think is reality, but actually they can move into a greater reality, which is relationship with your son. So we thank you that you've given us the ability to give the greatest gift on earth, the gift of salvation through your son living inside of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, should we just get rid of the running order? But I 
Okay, trouble. Okay, look, shall I just drop it on the floor? It's okay, guys, I can remember it all. <laughs> but anyway, do you know what? It, it's awesome, isn't it? The Holy Spirit can be so, so free. But the good thing is the Holy Spirit can also be structured because God is a God of, he's a God of order, isn't he? God is a God of order. So you know what? Sometimes people think, but if you prepare, if you write down your running order, if you write your message down, if you read it off the page, where's God? But the thing is, God's in the preparation. When you're sitting at home and you're writing down the words and you write your message and you stand here, and I'm not talking about me, Andrew, whoever, I'm just talking about in general. When you stand here and all you can do is do this and read what you've written, doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not in it because he was in it when you wrote it. He was in the running order. Do you know, I don't believe that me and Andrew and whoever else puts to the running order decides, okay, this will work here, this will work there. Do you know, this is God's running order. You know, just because we wrote it down on a piece of paper doesn't mean it's ours. It means it's his. So anyway, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but anyway, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give you a couple of notices. Um, do you know, for the first time ever, it's actually quite warm in here. Somebody want to open a window? <laughs> I don't say that very often. I told you guys, those tongues of fire are in the room. So <laughs> anyway... So, as Andrew did say at the beginning as well, do you know, not just because it, it is Pentecost, but, you know, every Sunday or any time you're with a believer, do you know, if you, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit or if you don't speak in tongues, if you, you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit but you've never spoken in tongues, that's something that can take place today. It's something that can take place at any time, to be honest. But it can definitely take place today at the end of the service. So, keep that in mind. Right, so my notices for you guys before we um, hear the word are, uh, sorry, I'm smiling to myself, just ignore me. Um, so this week we don't have Bible study. So for those of you that normally come to Bible study, we don't have Bible study simply because, most of you probably know, there is a big conference starting on Thursday called Grace and Faith with Andrew Womack and a lot of other people that have come over from America. And a lot of us are involved in that conference. It starts Thursday morning. So we made a decision not to have Bible study on Wednesday night to allow everybody to be as prepared as they need to be. So we'll resume Bible study the week after. Um, we have some more information for you now about the event we've been talking about in July, which involves a man called Jonathan Conrath. I believe we have a slide that... Aha, there is the slide. Um, so it's going to take place Wednesday to Saturday. We already told you this information, I believe. There is a link that you can click on. Now, if you don't have that link, it's fine because um, we can give it to you. We can let you know. We can send it to you. We can put it onto the Facebook page. Actually, it's already on the Facebook page for those of you on live stream. So you can find it on there. For those of you in the room, we can direct you to it. So if you want to sign up, there is a cost to it. It's taking place Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 10 o'clock till 4 o'clock, and also Wednesday, Thursday, Friday evening, 7 till 9. Those are the events that are paid for. So the mornings, if you want to do all of them, is £80 for all of them. Or if you think, I don't know what it's about, I don't know if I like it, you can sign up for one, which I believe is £30. I believe it's £30. You can find all this information when you click on the link. So um, if you want to come to the evenings... It's £40, because obviously they're shorter sessions. If you want to come to one, it's £15. You haven't got to try and remember all this. Like I said, you can find it on the link. You can find it on our website. You can find it on the Mission 24 website. And we can give you this information afterwards as well. Uh, but if you do want to sign up, you do need to do it through um, a platform called Eventbrite. If you don't know what I'm talking about, talk to us afterwards. So you do need to do it through there, because you're signing up through Mission 24. So your details are going to them. Obviously, they'll be passed on to us but you need to do it through that link. Um, the Saturday is completely free, so if you want to come along to the Saturday, it's a recap session in the morning, followed by outreach in Warsaw in the afternoon, different to how we do it, so it won't be the dancing and the drama, it will be a different kind of outreach. You won't have to dance and sing, don't worry. Um, and in the evening, we'll have a service here, like a healing service, a gospel service, just inviting the people from, um, that we've spoken to in the afternoon and everybody else who wants to come. 
So that is mission 24. It's the 12th of July, so there's still plenty of time. So we'll get some um, leaflets printed as well, and then that way we can give them to people because it's sometimes easier when you've got the information in your hand, isn't it? Anyway, just to quickly let you know, we have planned an outreach in Warsaw before that, the 10th of June. So I'm just giving you the date. Um, that's a picture from our last outreach. That's in Warsaw Town Centre. So the T-shirts the look strange, don't they? One says suicide and one says loneliness. Bad T-shirts, eh? But anyway, those are the T-shirts we wear when we do outreach because we do a drama that has a lot of negative words on um, because it depicts the world. And um, people are very drawn to them, actually, because a lot of people are like, oh, you're wearing a T-shirt with suicide on, and I actually wanted to kill myself the other day. So it actually draws a lot of people, and you're able to, to tell them about the solution, which is Jesus. But that's a picture from Warsaw Town Zender, and we will be there on the 10th of June, which is a Saturday. Um, so I'm just letting you know that date. And that is all that I want to tell you. Now I'm going to hand over to Julio. Julio? Good morning. morning. Lovely to see you. As Selena said, my name's Julio. I've met most of you, I think. I've been told to put the microphone up a little bit. That's better. Great. I want to start with um, uh, a verse that's very familiar with, uh, or too many of us. Jeremiah 29, 11, verse 11, which says... For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. That's in the Revised Standard Version, which is slightly different to the one on the screen. But um, it's basically telling us that God has a purpose for us. And that, and that is where our welfare, our joy and our fulfillment is found. Do you want to know what God's will for your life is? Yes. Okay. Amen. Most of us do. Uh, many Christians are, are looking uh, and seeking God's will in their lives. But how do we find that purpose? How do we find it? <clears throat> I'm glad you asked that question, Julio. <laughs> Please answer it. <laughs> so, the I listened to a, a, a message uh, from one of the Karis teachers recently, um, and one thing that was really clear is there is a clear objective will of God. So there's two wills of God. There's the will of God for every Christian, the objective will of God. And there's a subjective will of God, which is what he wants for you individually. But the, the, uh, the purpose that we find in Christ is through that obedience to that objective, plainly stated, plainly discovered uh, will of God that we find in his word. Things that apply to all born-again believers, not just individual people. So, for example, in Luke 10, 27, it tells us, I'm paraphrasing here, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. There's no question, we, we, we have to love God. That's, that's the primary function of, of us as born-again believers. Then in Matthew 6, 33, he tells us, seek first, but seek first his righteousness, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be yours as well. So in the previous verses, he talked about why do you worry about clothing or your food. Um, we don't have to worry about these things. We have to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, putting him first, like Jesus told us in, in Luke 10, Love God, the Lord your God, with all your heart. And then in, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to 
draw out a verse, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, uh, which says, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. For then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Um, yeah, wine. Don't worry about the, the actual things. We don't have barns necessarily. We might have bank accounts. We might have a piggy bank. Um, but when it comes to honoring God with our first fruits, tithing is a good place to start. So tithing is uh, an old-fashioned word, uh, but it means a regular offering to God, a regular giving of, of uh, a portion of what we receive. And the example was set a long time ago by Abram, uh, and even before him. Uh, but Abram specifically um, had received no instructions about giving, about offering, about tithing. But after his victory over the kings that attacked him and took, took all his property in Genesis 14, uh, he met, he attacked, he, he defeated them, got all his, his goods back, um, and he met with Melchizedek, who was the high priest. Uh, we don't know much about Melchizedek, but um, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything he'd won back from those kings. Um, so that, that, that tenth is, is, is um, revealed or, or uh, referred to in that chapter in Genesis 14. If you're not tithing, you're cutting yourself off from a part of the blessing of God. Um, in Proverbs 11:24. It tells us that one man gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds and only suffers want. And we see from uh, Jesus' re reference to the, uh, to the little old lady who was putting two tiny coins into the treasury at the temple, um, that it doesn't matter whether we're rich or poor, that whatever we have we can give to God. We need to give to God because that opens the door of heaven for him to bless us. So finding the will of God, like I referred to earlier, the purpose for our lives, one of the purposes, one of the things we are encouraged, uh, even commanded to do, uh, and is a principle that, that God has laid down for us, is to give, give back to him, to his work. He desires prosperity for us to be used for the benefit of others. So he told Abraham back in, uh, again in Genesis, um, you're blessed and all the nations will be blessed through you. I will bless you and all the nations will be blessed through you. I'm paraphrasing again. But basically, um, we, can, we can be blessed and pass on that blessing to, to other people. And with the, with the view that he is our source, that God is our source of all these uh, blessings, we can develop an eternal mindset that sees not just things around us, but that we're sowing into the future, into eternity. And it's the only way, uh, it's, it is only what you give away that you get to keep because you're planting that into eternity. So in closing, I'd like to say, give intentionally, not out of compulsion, but with joy, because you're actually sowing into your own welfare. Give by sowing your finances into good soil. So don't just say, oh, I'll, I'll give it to the first beggar on the corner that I see or I'll give it to this charity or that charity. But pray about it. Be intentional about where you sow your seed because you want fertile ground that's going to use that money properly for the benefit of the kingdom. And give in faith, believing that you will receive. Because one of my favorite verses, 
Jesus in Luke says, give and it shall be given to you. Shaken together, no air bubbles. Pouring over shall be poured into your lap. So it's abundance will come back to you. Not necessarily in kind, but you will receive a blessing. Amen. So we're going to receive an offering now. Um, we do have envelopes for anybody who wants to give cash. I believe the um, bank details are on the screen behind me. Um, if, you, if, you've got, if you want an envelope, you can fill in your details, which will allow us to receive back gift aid. Uh, or, of course, you can uh, transfer funds straight into the bank. So we'll just wait a few moments for all that to happen, and then I'll give thanks as we receive the offering. Thank you, Louise. So let's just uh, close our eyes and, and pray. Father, we thank you for the abundant blessings that you pour out on us. Thank you for Jesus and for today as we remember that you gave the Holy Spirit to be with us at all times, Lord. He is in us. He works through us. He leads us. He guides us. And we just thank you that in a small way, we can uh, uh, just offer you these uh, funds in front of us, Lord. Pray that you would uh, use them for the glory of your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Very good. Is everybody good? I'm having a bit of a move around on the, on the stage. Let me get this off. So today is Pentecost. Amen to that. Um, and we're going to be speaking the word out. Julio's message just now, it's funny. There was something he said just at the end. And I said to Selena, I've not thought about that before. Now, I've heard it many times, but I hadn't actually thought about what he said. And it was this. Everything you keep, you lose. And everything you give away, you keep. That's what he said. And it just flicked into my mind, well, how, how does that work? <clears throat> Isn't the Holy Spirit quick, the way he just brings something to you? And it's this, and what you're probably going to say, yeah, I know, but I was a bit slow on the uptake, so I, I hadn't thought about it. And it's this, every penny that you give away, all of your time that you give away, you know, if you're going to give away time, um, all of your energy that you give away here now goes where? We think it, we've lost it. But in actual fact, it's being taken to the kingdom. It's being used for the kingdom. And it says that God never is a debtor to anybody. So he never, he's, he's never in debt to anybody. Anything that anybody ever gives him, he always pays back. So now, what you've given is now stored in heaven. 
And everything you keep, once you die, is gone. Because you, you can't take it with you. So you could store up all of your money and you could have you know, a trillion pounds in the bank. But as soon as you die, you've lost it. You've lost all of any more time you have. You've lost any more energy that you have. It's gone completely. But if you would have sown it into the kingdom, it would have actually been waiting for you when you go into his kingdom. And so I've never thought about it like that before. And so for us as believers, the more we want, really, we have to give away. The more we want to hold on to when we see Jesus, we have to let go of things. Our time, our finances, our energies, our love, our blessings, everything that we want to hold on to because we want it for ourselves. Jesus is saying, if you give it away, I'll take it and I'll store it for you and I'll give it back to you when I see you. It's good, man. It's very good. It's very good. So that's what came to me. So thank you, Julia. Very good indeed. <clears throat> so today is Pentecost, and we're going to share along those lines today. Um, isn't it funny? You know, when you start to think about a, a certain event in the Bible, and then you start to look at it, so many different things come into your mind, and so many things are there that you can speak about. Um, and today, m myself and, S and Selena are going to share, so we're going to split the time, so um, we're, we're taking half time each. But so... What I want to speak about today is why the Holy Spirit had to come. Sorry, I'm just correcting my spelling. Why the Holy Spirit had to come. And I'm going to give three reasons why it was better that he came and Jesus left. Because really, when we think about it, our thinking is, you know, if Jesus just turned up here now, we'd all we'd all get excited and everybody would be around him all touching him and speaking to him and, and, and that kind of stuff but if he turned around and says you know what guys I'm going to Andrew and Selena's house now for a little while but I'll be back you'd all still be sad because you want to be able to touch him and speak to him and ask him questions that kind of thing even though he said he was going to come back he'd still be sad <clears throat> that's what it was like People who knew him, people who could touch him, people who could physically interact with him, wanted him to stay. But he says here, in John 16, uh, verse 7 to 11, he's speaking to his disciples. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. That word expedient means convenient or practical for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because you believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged so when Jesus came he was a man but he was fully God as well he was a man in flesh you could, you could touch him you could speak to him you could listen to his words but he was completely God as well and when he left heaven he actually left all of his powers behind it said he took them off like a, a coat and he, and he left them there and he came as a child he was born and he had to grow into a man and become like us, a man or a woman, you know, as an adult. And it tells us that in Luke 2, 52. It says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favour with God and man. So he grew. He wasn't the smartest man in the world when he came. He didn't, he didn't have wisdom. He didn't have knowledge. All of these things he had to, to grow into as he spent time growing as a man. So he appears and then... He's off to my house and Selena's house. And you're all really sad because me and Selena have got to spend more time than you guys with Jesus. <laughs> so that's what it was like. But now that the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, yeah, I'm just, just rounding this off. As, as he came at, at Pentecost, every person that hears the true gospel of Jesus Christ has a chance to be born again 
and to enter into the kingdom. If they call on that name, Jesus, they will be saved. So my first uh, point, as it would be, is that Jesus could only be in one place at a time. But the Holy Spirit can be everywhere at the same time. And it tells us in Romans 10.9 that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. You make, you make a confession, you'll be saved. And so as that happens to you and to us and to the people on the live stream and to everybody else that, that does that, there is a, uh, a transfer you're translated, your nature, the sinful nature that was in you from birth is removed and the Holy Spirit then comes to live in you and you become a child of God and that's the gospel. Amen. Amen. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, <clears throat> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given us, given to us, sorry, the ministry of reconciliation. So our job is now, because he's given us a job, a ministry, even though, you know, Julio asked, what, what do you, do you want to find out what God's will is for your life? Well, there, he's just told you right there. Our job is to reconcile the world back to Jesus. That's our job. Whatever you think it might be, in, in, in the, um, if you're going to be a pastor, a teacher, a prophet, an evangelist, um, a businessman, a housewife, all of these things is a calling. But on the back of that, that calling leads us to bring people back to know Jesus Christ, wherever you are. Amen? So we all have a... A, a job to do now that Jesus is gone. So Jesus can only be in one place at one time. The Holy Spirit can be in billions of people all at the same time. So that's the first reason Jesus had to go and the Holy Spirit had to come. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, it's funny, isn't it, that, the, that Satan was an angel. Yeah, his name was Lucifer. And it says he actually stood in the presence of God and ministered to God. And so he saw and heard things you know, we've, we've never heard or, or ne I've, never, I've never seen. And when he rebelled against God, he still didn't know. He had no idea that the finished work of the cross was going to allow the Holy Spirit to be reproduced in billions of people. Because it says here, if he would have known that, he never would have crucified the Lord. You know? And this is the wisdom and the mystery that, that is spoken about in the Bible. The wisdom from God is this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to recreate my spirit in so many people. And the mystery, it was hidden from the foundation of the world. I can imagine the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and God sitting in a room chatting about this. And all the angels like trying to listen in, in the door, like, like trying to listen like this. What are they talking about? And they're making plans for this mystery that was hidden from the foundation of the world. This is what we're going to do. When it all goes wrong, we're going to send Jesus first, then we're going to send the Holy Spirit. And we're going to bring everybody back to ourselves. It's just awesome. Absolutely awesome. And so, once this has happened, once you've accepted Christ and you get born again, this is my second point. We can now be born again. When Jesus was here, and he, he was only in one place, all of the people that are born again today had no chance. Jesus couldn't make his way across of all, all these countries and all these, these continents to speak to people and get them born again. But now the Holy Spirit has come on Pentecost. All we need to do is believe in our heart 
and confess with our mouth. And he, I don't know how he does it, but as Andrew Womack says, he, he does it legally. It comes from <laughs> wherever he was <laughs> to wherever you are, and he, trans, he translates us into the kingdom of God, and we become different people, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So because the Holy Spirit is here now, we can be born again. And this is a scripture I'm going to read to you now. Um, it's quite a long scripture, actually, so please bear with me. It's John 3, 3 to 18. And this is where Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. Um, and Nicodemus was a, a teacher of the law. He was a pastor of pastors. He was a priest of priests. He was one of the top guys. Um, and he saw that Jesus wasn't a normal person. He says at the beginning of the verse, he says, I know that you've been sent from God because what you're doing, normal people can't do. He says, so I need to know what's going on. And this is what Jesus says to him in verse number three. So Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So let me just stop there. There's people listening on live stream who have heard different doctrines, different teachings saying there is many ways to get to God. I'm here to tell you, there's not. What it says right here is that unless you're born again of the Spirit, you will never see the kingdom of God. Amen? This is a truth. I'm sure that, as I say, many people have heard different things, but this is the only way. Nicodemus says unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So he says that twice to him, just to, to clarify what he's trying to say to him. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows and listeth, and thou, thou hearest the sound there, thereof, but cannot tell where whence it comes I don't know why I do this that King James messes me up <laughs> and whether it goes so it is everyone that is born of the spirit Nicodemus answered and said unto him how can these things be and Jesus answered again said unto him you are a master of Israel and knowest not these things verily verily I say unto thee we speak that we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? This is awesome. And this is another thing. Unless you're born of the Spirit, you will never understand spiritual truths. It doesn't matter how simple the truth is if you're not born of the Spirit, that truth will elude you. And it's the, 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 one of the simplest things you, we can say to you as a, as a person who doesn't know Jesus, and it will confuse you. You won't understand it. And he's saying exactly the same to this man here. You've been following and chasing after God all of your life, and I'm saying something that's very basic. But you don't understand it. Why? Because you've never been born of the Spirit. So... Let me go to um, verse number 13. And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he's saying he didn't send Jesus to condemn the world. He sent, the world, he sent Jesus to, to save the world. He that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believes not 
is condemned already. I'm not going to go into it. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So here he's saying, unless you believe on the name of Jesus, you are already condemned. So think about that for a second. There's, even though there's a, there's a day of judgment coming, God's not going to stand there and say, you, 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 you're condemned. You're already condemned today. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ right now, you are facing a judgment, not based on God's uh, approval of you or not, but that you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. So it's very important. You need to be born of the Spirit. So my first point was Jesus can only be one place. The Holy Spirit can be everywhere. My second point, point is now the Holy Spirit has come, you can be born again. Amen? You can be born again of the Spirit. You can be born again of the Spirit. <clears throat> so, Nicodemus wants to know, how do I become born again? And Jesus tells him, you have to be born of the Spirit. So many, pe many people think that, again, there's many ways into heaven and to get eternal life. Jesus again said, the only way you can get into heaven is to be born again. There's no other name by which a man can be saved. The only way is to accept Jesus Christ. And I'm laboring it, but I want to get this point across. In Galatians 4, 4 to 7, it says this, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. They might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And my third point is this. Because you have the Holy Spirit, you have become an heir of God. And you are now open to, to his divine nature. So the first one is Jesus can only be in one place at one time. The Holy Spirit can be anywhere. The second one is you have to be born again. And because the Holy Spirit has come, that's now available to us. And my third point is you have now become an heir because you are born again. Amen? So what is an heir? It's not heir. It's not heir. <laughs> It's an heir. <laughs> so an heir. A person who inherits, listen to this, a person who inherits and continues the work of a predecessor. Okay. So you inherit and you continue the work of a predecessor. That's a person that came before you. Okay. And it's Jesus said this in Luke 24, 46 to 49. And said unto them, Jesus said unto them, Thus it is written, Okay, so thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem and you you are witnesses of these things and behold I send the promise of the Father upon you but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endowed with power from on high so Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying wait until you receive power why? because now that you are an heir and now that you have a job to do to continue my work, you need to be filled with power. Because as Nicodemus said, I can see that you're not a normal man. I can see you're from God, but there's something different about you. I need to know what it is. And he says, because I'm filled with the Spirit. And so now the Holy Spirit has come. We've accepted him. 
we are now heirs. We are open to that power that Jesus walked in, that Nicodemus saw in him. Whether you believe it or not, you are now and have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead inside of you. You can speak the wisdom of Christ. You can think the wisdom of Christ. You can do miracles. You can see people raised from the dead. You can see sick, uh, sick people healed. Studying. You have the mind of Christ, my friend. Your future is set in Christ. Maybe you don't think so. I'll say this to you right now, my friend. Maybe you look at yourself and you think, you know what, I don't know what my future holds. But let me tell you, the Holy Spirit that's inside of you, Kiriakos, I'm talking to you, my friend, is going to show you your future. He has power for you. He has provision for you. He has a wife for you. He has a family for you. He has a future for, me, for you, my friend. And whatever you think you look like today, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit in, in you is going to transform your life from glory to glory. In Jesus' name. Amen to that. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 3.9 says this, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's builders. Building, sorry. So we have the Holy Spirit in us, and because of that, we are laborers, co-laborers with Christ. We are heirs. So let me just finish with this last one, last scripture, and I'll round this off. In Mark 16, 15 to 18, it says this. Jesus speaking to his disciples. Any disciples out there, please raise your hand. Okay, so all of you, so you've got no excuses. I've seen it all. It's on live stream. We've seen it all. We've seen all the hands go up. Jesus said this. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes is baptized and shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. We got any believers out there? Please raise your hand. Okay, that's all of you again. We got believers out there. <laughs> In my name you shall cast out demons. Amen. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. You shall lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know, just to finish here, we are heirs of God's kingdom. We are co-laborers. We are continuing the work of our predecessor. Because the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, he has allowed us to be uh, united with Christ. Today, you know, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what your life looks like. It doesn't matter what, how it's going. It's important, but it doesn't matter because the one who's in you is greater than he that's in the world. If you allow him, he will change your heart. And if he changes your heart, he will change your circumstances. The Holy Spirit is in you. He's your comforter. He loves you. He wants to guide and he wants to lead us. But on the back of that, he wants us to, to exert this power that's inside of us. He wants us to prophesy to people. He wants us to give people words. He wants us to lay our hands on the sick. And he wants us to see them recover. Not because of us, but because, because we're continuing the work that Jesus did. So today, when you remember the word Pentecost comes into your, your mind, remember that you are a partaker of his divine nature because the Holy Spirit came. Amen? So I hope you've enjoyed that, guys. And I'll pass it over to Selena. Amen. <laughs> Hello. Um, so Andrew used a word towards the end there, power. And power is the thing that I'm going to talk about, generally talk about. Um, but before I do that, do you, know, um, do you know, I was thinking, do you know, life is not meant to be boring, you know, guys. And this might seem a bit, well, that's not very spiritual, but anyway. Life is not meant to be boring. You know, if, if, you, if we are believers, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, if we have what Jesus had inside of him, then our lives should not be boring. Our lives should be exciting. There should be fun. There should be lives that we look forward to. Do you know, I said to Andrew yesterday, because I very often hear born-again believers saying, I can't wait to go and be with Jesus. I can't wait to go to heaven. I can't wait to see the Lord. And I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, no offense, 
but I'm going to be with you for eternity. I'm actually enjoying my life on earth. Do you know, that, that is how I feel. You know, I want to be with Jesus. You know, Jesus is with me anyway. But what I mean is I've never, ever had, and perhaps I don't know, perhaps it's something that happens later on, I don't know. But I've never had that feeling that, oh, I can't wait to go and be with Jesus. Never. And the reason why I believe I haven't, I don't know. Even when the mics don't work. See, it's awesome. Ooh, hello. Get that? Holy Spirit's here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, bit of an echo there. But anyway, is that better, Syrian? Yeah. So, yeah, so I was just thinking, you know, that life as a believer is not meant to be normal, you know. It's not meant to be normal, and it's not meant to be boring. It's supposed to be supernatural and exciting. If you don't wake up in the morning excited, then... The Holy Spirit inside of you is trying to knock the walls of your body and say, hello, let me out. Because life is not supposed to be just mundane, day by day. Let's just get by. Oh, all these things that we have to deal with. Oh, you know what? Jesus help me. And yay, another day. It's not meant to be like that. Do you know, I really think that the, the mundane things, like when I say mundane, they're not, you know, they are exciting as well. Like, you know, buying a house, getting married, starting a family, paying your bills, day by day life, Yeah. Not necessarily mundane, but it's kind of what everybody does, yeah? But that's not, that's not our life. I don't know if I'm getting across what I'm trying to say here. Do you know, for me, I could have everything or I could have nothing. But still, I want to be on the earth because life on the earth is exciting. Because you go to new places, you meet new people, you get to tell a person that does not know Jesus, hey, did you know there's another way? This life you live in is not the only one. There's actually a reality that is more real than this one that you can step into and be who you're meant to be. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if I'm getting my point across. This has nothing to do with my message, but it just occurred to me that life should not be boring. It should not be mundane. And I don't think we should be, as Christians, believers, and people might not agree with this. On live stream, you might not agree. I don't think we should be saying, I can't wait to go and be with Jesus. Jesus is with us now. And the reason he didn't get us born again and zap us straight up to heaven is because he wants us here. He wants us on this earth. We have a job to do, you know. We should be enjoying. We should be going out there and people should be looking at us and being like, what's going on with them? Why is everything falling apart and they're running down the road singing like everything's wonderful? Do you know what I mean? People should be looking at us and being like, what is going on? Because that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know, the, the people in the upper room before the Holy Spirit came, nobody was saying what's wrong with them and they're drunk. You know, why they're all acting so crazy, why they're talking like that. Soon as the Holy Spirit came, everybody was like, what's going on? Have them not been on the booze? Do you know what I mean? People were like, what is going on? These people are different. And that's what it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to get born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the power that raised Jesus from the dead and look like unbelievers. No offense to any unbelievers that are watching. But once you get saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you'll know what I mean. But we're not, you know, we're not supposed to look like unbelievers. We're supposed to look different? Because otherwise, why did he come? Do you know, why, why did the Holy Spirit come? Why do we need power? Anyway, let me talk about what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so what I want to talk about is power. Um, and I'm not talking about physical power. And I'm not talking about just power to get our own way. The power I'm talking about is power to live a victorious Christian life. Because if we've been told you're victorious, you're an overcomer, you can do all things through Christ, then how? How? The way we do it is the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know, when you get born again, you have the Spirit of God in you. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's like a, a force that now pushes that, that Spirit out of you. The power of God now has, it's, it's like an outlet. It's like before you had the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you struggled to, I don't know, maybe give something up. The moment you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, and when you realize what that power is for, you draw on it, and then it's like, okay, I can give that up. Not because I've suddenly got strength but because the holy spirit in me enables me to live the life 
that Jesus said, I'm supposed to live. That's what the Holy Spirit's for. Jesus came to save us. Now we're going to heaven, but we're on the earth. The Holy Spirit came to enable us to live on the earth. Because believe me, if I didn't have the Holy Spirit, I might have got saved, but I wouldn't be in a good place now. I might be going to heaven, but I'd still be the mess that I was because there would have been no power in my life to change. It just would have been saved and stuck, <laughs> as we've heard before, saved and stuck. But that's not what happened, is it? So, you know, the story in um, Acts, I'm not going to read it all, but, you know, Jesus told the disciples that they would need the power of his spirit and that after receiving it, that they would do what he did and more. You know, he said to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And, you know, this is Jesus. He knows what he's talking about, yeah? He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which some of you may know, may not. It's a separate experience to being born again. It can happen simultaneously, but it's separate. You get born again, which means now the Spirit of God lives inside of you. Your spirit's alive. You're connected to God. You get baptized in the Holy Spirit, which is the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit, which is a separate experience. For me, it happened straight away, one after the other. But for some people, it can be years apart. For some, it can just be any time, but it is a separate experience. Now, that scripture I read out there, um, where it says you will receive power, do you know, <laughs> this is a general generalization, yeah? But most Christians I've met in my life, yeah, before being saved and after, I would say, without being judgmental, that most of them are lacking in power because most of them are not living the life that God has for them, including myself. I'm not saying that I'm walking in everything God has for me because I'm not. Do you know, there's areas where I'm lacking in power, not lacking as in I haven't got it, but lacking in the knowledge of how to draw it out in a certain area. So that power, it, it is a Greek word, these Greek words we love, but it's dunamis, yeah? And I'm saying it like that. And it, say, and it means to be able, to be capable, the ability. It's a miraculous power. That's what that power means. So when he said, you will receive power, he meant you will receive the ability, you will become capable, you will be able to. That's what that word power means, yeah? So when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we receive God's ability. So you can't do that, but God can, which is good, because now he's given you his ability, his power through the Holy Spirit, yeah? And it was the Spirit that did the works through Jesus. Do you know, Jesus didn't do any works until the Spirit had come upon him. He had to wait for that. Jesus had to wait for that. Do you know, so for us, it is the same thing. So the power spoken of is the ability to live the Christian life on the earth. Because being born again, and then the Bible says all of these amazing promises, and then most of us look at our lives and we're like, well, it doesn't really look like that. But we just continue on and on and on, just carrying on in life, wondering why it doesn't look like that, feeling condemned, feeling bad, and asking other people. And it's because we don't realize that the power of God's inside of us, and we have to draw it out. You know, God doesn't stand in front of you and draw power out of you. God's given us everything we need, but we have to get the understanding that it's there. And then in an area where we need power to overcome, we draw that power out. So anyway, moving on to the same scripture where it says, and you will be my witness. So that word witness, yeah, used there, it means one who remembers, one who has information or knowledge, one who can give information, who can bring light, specifically referring to the gospel, yeah? So our lives, after we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, should be a witness to those around us. So people should look at your lives and witness something going on, yeah? As I've already said, if people don't look at your life and wonder how you live the life you live, then you're probably not walking in all of the power that the Holy Spirit has for you. Because people should look at you and say, wow, how, how are they doing that? Or, wow, how did they overcome in that situation? Or, wow, how didn't they fall apart? People should be questioning your life if the power of the Holy Spirit is flowing through you. You shouldn't be a normal person. I'm not trying to condemn anybody here, by the way, yeah? Because we're all in the same boat. There's so many areas in my life where I know that God's already given me the ability. And maybe I just haven't worked it out in my head. And maybe sometimes we choose not to use the ability because we're comfortable with something. Oh, I don't want to change that. Even though I know I can because God's given me the ability, I don't want to change that. 
So just realizing you have the ability doesn't change your life. Realizing you have power inside of you to overcome and to live how Jesus said you should is a gradual working out in every single area. But we should look different. We should look different. So don't be satisfied to be where you are. Be satisfied when people say to you, how are you doing that? How did you afford that? You know, what you've been up to? Let people wonder about your life. That's the way it's supposed to be. Do you think people let Jesus walk past and just thought, yeah, just a normal bloke? They were all like, who's that crazy man doing all these mad things? You know, how, how is he doing that? What's, what's he up to? Do you know, that's what our lives should look like too. And, do you know, witness in this scripture, it doesn't mean to go out and speak to someone. Because, you know, we witness to people. We go out, we tell them the gospel. But that's not what it's talking about here. Even though that's a good thing to do. It's not a bad thing to do. It says that we will be a witness. Our lives will be a witness. It doesn't say, and you shall go out and witness about me. It says you will be a witness. Which means that as you walk down the street, people will witness the power of God in you. They will see it. That's what we're meant to be. So we can see just from that verse that it is essential to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and to allow that power to flow through us, to become witnesses to those around us. And we are witnesses of the life-giving power of God. That's what we're witnesses of. We're not witnesses that we're so awesome. You don't walk down the street and go, like, look at me, I'm so awesome. I mean, you can if you want, but that's not what it's for, yeah? We're witnesses to the life-giving power of God to overcome to be victorious, to walk in health, to walk in joy, to walk in love. I mean, imagine if you were with, okay, I'm just going to give an example. I might not refer to any of you guys, but imagine if you were with a whole group of your family and a big argument starts and everyone's arguing and fighting and you're just sitting there all chilled out, smiling, and they're like, what's the matter with you? And you're like, nothing. And they're like, well, are you not going to join in? And you're like, no. And it's just because that's the power of, there's peace, there's love, there's joy. You just don't want to join in anymore. That, that feeling's gone. The power, the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit has enabled you to react in a different way. This is what our lives are a witness of, the power of God working in us. And, you know, it, it isn't possible to walk in the blessings of God without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not. Sometimes we might think, why am I not seeing this? And we forgot to bring the Holy Spirit into it. Do you know what I mean? Why don't I see this? Why don't I see my healing? Did you ever think about the fact that you have the power through the Holy Spirit inside of you and maybe if you communicate with him, he's going to tell you exactly how you're going to receive your healing? It's not as simple as, but the Bible says I'm healed, so why am I not healed? Do you know what I mean? That power is inside of us. We have to draw it out. Now, you know, we live in, the world we live in, it's not a nice world, is it? It's a fallen world. And you've only got to look around you to see the evidence of the power of darkness everywhere. The world's a mess. Sometimes it makes me smile when I hear Christians saying, can you believe this? Can you believe that? And I'm like, obviously. I mean, you know, Satan, hello. Do you know I mean? It's not going to get any better. The world is not going to get any better. Do you know, we, we think, oh, no, we need to, to try and make it a better place. It's not going to happen. It's just going to get darker and it's going to get worse. It is because it's a fallen world. But for us, we have that power of God to walk through that world and still be who God called us to be. You know, with everything falling down around us, with the world... I was going to say a phrase then, but it's probably not a good one. With the world just falling apart, <laughs> we should be able to still shine as Jesus for people to see, you know what, that's a mess, that's darkness over there, but look at that person, what's different about them? You know, that's the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we also receive power to liberate our spirits to communicate directly with God. You know, I never thought about it like that before until this. <laughs> you know, I know we receive the, the ability to speak in tongues, and I've explained it to people many times that now you can speak to God but the actual way of thinking that it liberates our spirits to communicate directly with God your spirit is is kind of like born again but a little bit I don't know how to put this without you getting the wrong idea um it's born again but it, it's it, it wants to communicate directly with God and that ability to speak in tongues is that it's like it's like having a secret language, isn't it? It's like if me and Andrew could speak a language that nobody else could speak, I could communicate with Andrew. You guys wouldn't have a clue what we're talking about, but we know. And when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues, that's what that language is. It's the ability to communicate directly with God and for him to communicate with you. Because believe me, my natural mind has no idea what I should pray for sometimes. My natural mind does not know what's coming, but my spirit does. 
the Spirit of God does. And when you speak in tongues, you're praying exactly what needs to be prayed. It doesn't make any sense. I know when I first got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, I was like, oh, this is good, but <laughs> what's going on? I, you know, it was, it was awesome, but I didn't understand it. You, you know, you understand it more as you, as you walk in your Christian life and you speak in tongues, you read the Bible, God speaks to you, you see things happening and you start to understand about it. Because, you know, in our, in our human bodies, in our carnal bodies, we have only five senses, yeah? What we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we touch, what we smell. Our, with our, our five senses, even when we're baptised in the Holy Spirit, we can sometimes try and work things out with our five senses. We try and intellectualise the things of God. Do you know what I mean? What does that scripture mean? No, oh, let me work it out. Let me look it up in the Strong's Concordance. Let me find the Greek. Let me take it apart. How about let me ask the Holy Spirit? Do, do, do you know what I mean? Sometimes I forget. You know, I'm like, let me look at so-and-so's living commentary. Let me Google it. Let me this, let me that. Oh, yeah, making a good teaching here. Holy Spirit's like, why don't you ask me? You know, he's better than Google. He's better than the, the concordance. He's better than the living commentary. He's better, no offense, Andrew Warwick. He's better than, you know, everything. But sometimes we forget that that power is inside of us and we can ask him. Now, do you know, I don't know if I was a little bit excitable today because... Some of you know, Andrew knows, it's, it's going to sound strange, this is. It's my birthday today. It's not my birthday birthday. Calm down, guys. Hang on. Hold on. No, no, get this. I'm seven. It's my born again birthday, okay? So it's the day I got born again, seven years ago today, 28th of May, 2016. And for some people, being born again is, they can't remember the day. For some people, it's kind of like, it feels like they always were. For some people that got born again and things didn't change much, yeah? But that's not what happened for me. So I got born again and that was an instant moment in my life when the word of God hit me. And I was just like, wow. I was sat at a conference, uh, Andrew Womack conference, and I heard him teaching, the whole, the whole of his teaching, it was like something switched on in my head and I understood what he was talking about. He was talking about um, that it's not on our side, it's on God's side, that it's what Jesus has done for us, not what we have to do. But then he was also talking about faith and how the faith is inside of us and how we always ask God to do this, we ask God to do that, but actually he's put it inside of us and that it's us as he always likes to use the example, with the electricity, it's us that has to flick the switch. Do you know, the power's there, but until you turn the light on, the light ain't coming on. The power's still there, though. See, these sort of things I've never understood. And he was talking also about, about thinking negative. Do you know, the way we think, our lives follow the way we think about ourselves. If you think you're always going to be a failure, well, guess what? You're always going to be a failure because that's what you think. He was talking about the way you speak, that the power of life and death is in your tongue, and that if you tell everybody how your life's falling apart and how it's so difficult, then guess what? It's always going to be that way. I never knew any of this. You know, for me, I mean, you guys might be the same when you were born again, I don't know. But I was, at the point I got born again, I was so desperately searching for a way out. I was that messed up in the life I was in. I was desperate. I was like, there's got to be a way out. And I didn't understand the things of God. And I remember sitting there and realizing that you could receive Jesus, that you could be baptized in this thing called the Holy Spirit. I had no understanding of this. And that then you could be given power to be victorious over all the bad stuff and live a good life. Basically, that's what I understood. And nobody ever told me that. I don't know if you guys were told that. I don't know if there's people listening on a live stream that didn't know that, don't know that. But I didn't know that. I had no idea. I thought you just had to keep trying to be a better person, try and do this, try and do that. Eventually, you'll have a breakthrough. God will see how, how much you're trying. And, you know, then maybe, maybe things will get better. I didn't realize that actually it's quite simple. And for some people, some people are like, it's not simple, but it is simple. You believe in Jesus, you get born again, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then you choose how you want to live your life. Now, that might sound a bit... doesn't work like that. You might be looking at me and thinking, that, that can't be true. But that's actually the truth. Because if you're born again, if you have Jesus in you, if you're going to heaven, if you have the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, then what can you not do? There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. In every situation, you can be who God has called you to be. 
You can walk in all of the blessings. You can overcome. You can be victorious. You can achieve whatever you put your mind to. But you have to choose to believe it. You have to choose to stop thinking negative. You have to choose to start speaking positive. You just have to choose to do it. It's not, you know, it's not a... It's a spiritual thing, but it's not a spiritual thing in a sense of you have to pray and you have to beg and you have to get yourself in the right place. That's not what it is. The Bible says that God put, that he put life and death before us. And then he said, choose. And then he said, choose life. Do you know what I mean? He made it simple and he told us the answer. That, that is how simple it is. But some people don't get it because they think it can't be that simple. How can the things of God be that simple? Shall I tell you how they can be? Because he loves us and he knows we humans. And if he made it difficult, we'd all be in trouble. So he didn't make it difficult. He made it very simple. But we make it difficult. And when I heard it preached, simple, that's what I understood. You can be born again. You can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can receive power. And then you can overcome all of the bad stuff. And you can walk in all of the good stuff. I had no understanding of the word of God. None at all. But that's what I heard. And I chose to believe it. And that's what it is. And do you know, I know it sounds really, you know, there might be people in here, there might be people on live stream thinking that can't be true, but I challenge you to speak to God and ask him if it's true. I challenge you to pick up his, up his word and start reading it and start making a choice because it is true. And when you choose in areas of your life, you will see change. It's impossible not to. So I've gone completely away from my notes now, but I'm going to come back. So... So like I said, I heard that the way our lives are going are a direct result of the way we are thinking and speaking, yeah? And I heard that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to draw on everything that God has deposited within us and overcome our circumstances. I also heard that God's not withholding on us. He's not withholding anything. He's given us everything we will ever need in this life and the one to come, already given it us, like the gifts in front of us, already. He's not going to give you anything else. And that's, that comes as a shock to people. God ain't going to give you nothing else. Nothing at all. He's given you everything already. Now it's for you to realize that and start taking hold of what he's given you. And I've already said, it's a choice. And do you know, I'm going <laughs> to... I was... <laughs> anyway, sorry. Seven years ago, yeah, there was a lot of stuff coming up to me being born again, yeah. It's like... I was just involved in so much stuff. I was addicted to drugs. I, was, I wanted to kill myself. I'd self-harmed. I'd been abused in every single way. You know, from the age of 12, I'd been in relationships with men that were double my age. I had six children by the time I was 20. I had health problems. Every single day I would wake up and I wouldn't want to be alive. Literally would not want to be alive, but I had to drag myself through the day because I had children, six of them, yeah? And I knew that you just got to get up, you know, get the kids to school, clean the house, get some up for dinner, pay the bills. And it was like dragging myself through the day. It was horrendous. It was horrible. And, you know, I spent 13 years with a man that was a lunatic. It was smashed my house up, hurt me, everything. And my life was absolute horrendous. It was a complete mess. And I know some people don't come to Jesus in that way. You know, some people... Praise God, some people have a testimony of knowing Jesus from being a child, which for me is awesome. Imagine going through your life with Jesus, being able to not fall into a mess. But also, you know, for all of us, wherever we come from, it's the power of God that brought us to where we are. But for me, I used to write things down, and I was going through them last night. I have this, like, folder of stuff I wrote over the time I was saved. And I read two pages to Andrew last night. And he said to me, you should read it at church. And I was like, yeah, and I, yeah, I should. Um, so I'm going to. I don't really want to, actually, in my flesh. But, hey, the pair of the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't really want to, but I'm going to. Now, the first one is before I was born again, yeah? Now, I just told you a little bit of what I was my situation was, yeah? Because this, when I read it, it does seem quite, oh, you were in a bit of a dark place. And I was in a very dark place. I really, really was. Because what I realize now is that you open doors to the enemy and he comes in, he comes in. Do you know, addiction, drugs, abuse, you know, sleeping with people before marriage, whatever you want to call it. I'd been involved in all sorts of stuff. And I know that the enemy was just doing whatever he wanted. 
and I wrote this on the 23rd of May. I was born again on the 28th of May. This is five days before. And this is just a little insert of what was going on in my life at the time, yeah? And you know, honestly, in my flesh, I'm just like, I don't want to read that. <laughs> after I've read this, I'm going to read one to you that I wrote on the 28th of May, the day I was born again, after I got home. Actually, it's probably after midnight the next day, but still. So you might not get the context of all of it, but obviously I can't change it because otherwise it wouldn't be what I wrote, yeah? So it starts with Monday night, I saw a spider. Um, let me just clarify, the spider wasn't real. This was a spiritual thing, okay? So the spider wasn't real. So it says, Monday night, I saw a spider in my bedroom. It was as huge as the post-it note on the wall. It disappeared. I slept in my daughter's bed that night and the night after because I was so scared. And then it said, Tuesday morning, I had dreams of snakes and I was trying to pick them up, but they were trying to bite me. These were dreams, by the way, guys, yeah? So I couldn't sleep again, so I slept in my daughter's bed again. And then it says, I went to Birmingham. I felt very detached. I went to a church where I'd been, where I knew some people. And then I'm not going to say their names, but it says, three people told me to kneel down, the pastor, his wife, and another man, told me to kneel down and said that they'd pray for me. So I repeated after them what they said, and I knelt down whilst they prayed. They prayed, and they were telling demons to leave. And I was shaking, and I couldn't stop. Now, this is, this is where it gets a bit funky, yeah? It says, I was shaking, and I couldn't stop this growling sound, this guttural sound, like something was trying to get out of my throat. I prayed for, they prayed for God's mercy, but then it felt like I lost my mind. The lady put hands on my stomach, and I felt sick, and it hurt my throat. And they kept speaking to something to get out of my body, but I felt so angry, and I just wanted to get away from them. So I kept turning my head and shaking, and it felt like a dark calm came over me, a defiant evil. And then I felt completely broken, and I just wanted it to leave me alone. In my dreams, I have felt like I belonged to a dark presence. Today, that dark presence was inside me. It controls me, and I belong to it. When I stood up, I was shaking and sweating so badly. I just wanted to pull away from them. I nearly shouted at them, no, stop. It felt like my insides were on fire. It was like a storm had started and so many demons were fighting, but there was one stronger and more powerful, one that was in control. I've never felt such a spiritual force in my body. I'm so confused and torn about where my loyalties lie. If Jesus loves me, I pray he delivers me. I am full of evil and it is very scary. That's what I wrote five days before I was born again. That's where I was mentally. That's where my mind was. That's where my body was. That's where my spirit was. That's what was going on inside of me. So there's a lot more to it that, than that, but that's what I wrote that day when I got home. And then, and then, five days later, I went to the conference, and when I got there, I'd been smoking weed. I wanted to die. I still felt exactly the same. I didn't feel any different. But after that, this is what I wrote, yeah. So I got born again. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And after that, I wrote this. It says, new experience when I sang and prayed and I raised my hands at the altar. It was me and God. And I told him, I'm ready, Lord. I am yours. I spoke to my leg. It's a bit random, but anyway. I spoke to my leg and told it to stop hurting in Jesus' name. And it did. I am blessed. God is good. I am a child of God. At that altar, I experienced oneness with Christ for the first time. I realized I had been denying him his place, and it was me, not him. I love God. I love Jesus. I love the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I spoke in tongues all the way home. I am, no longer an, I am no longer addicted. I have decided I am not an addict anymore. Now I live for Jesus to glorify his holy name properly. God is so good. At the beginning, I wanted to die, and by the end, I had eternal life. I heard and I acted and I spoke and Jesus answered. All I wanted was to be pulled, all I wanted was to be filled with the Holy Spirit and now I am. God's grace is amazing. He got me through the last two days in amazing ways. I have been touched by God and I'm not satisfied. <laughs> Sorry. I am hungry, so hungry and I want more of God, much more. I want to overflow with his love. I am delivered. He has set me free. The truth has set me free. I will hold on to this blessing. Nothing will take it away. My God is awesome. He is priceless. He is magnificent. I need no other. He is my Father. God, I love you. I've, and then it says, I felt peace run through my body. My flesh is weak, but my spirit is willing. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And. <laughs> 
These are two pieces of paper. This wasn't a sit down and write a, a wonderful thing. This is scribbled on pieces of paper. This isn't something that I prepared to write. It was just whatever was inside of me that came out onto that piece of paper. And you know, you can see there that, that it's not me. You know, it really isn't me. Sometimes people will say, because people will be like, oh, your testimony is so amazing. And it was so awesome how God just picked you up and just put you in this new life and changed all your life. And yes, it's amazing. And yes, God is amazing. But I was born again. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you're born again, exactly the same as what happened to you. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, exactly the same as what happened to you. The difference for me, and I don't mean to you, but the difference for me to when people say to me, God just picked you up. No, he didn't. He really did not. I had a revelation that day that I have a choice. Even when I went home and wrote that down and I read it afterwards, it says, I am not addicted anymore. I have decided I am not an addict. God didn't say you're not addicted anymore. I didn't go home and be like, where did the addiction go? I went home knowing that I had a power inside of me that would enable me to walk out of anything that wasn't of God. And I chose that day, I am not an addict anymore. I chose that. I chose that day, I'm not gonna be sending any more messages to people saying, my life's a mess, it's falling apart, I don't know what to do. Man, I, I, was, a, I was a mammoth message writer, man. I could send a text message this long about how bad the day was and how I couldn't cope and how the anxiety and the stress and the fear and the headaches and, oh man, do you know what I mean? And that day I realized you can no longer do that. Because if I do that, that will be my life. So from that day onwards, even though the same people asked the same question, how are you doing? My reply was, I'm okay. I might not have felt like it. I didn't walk out of that conference. I, w I walked out of there feeling high, do you know what I mean? So high and full of God, full of love, full of joy, full of peace. I woke up the next morning and there's another piece of paper that says I woke up on Sunday morning with anxiety. And then it says, but I told it to do one and it did. <laughs> So that's what he actually says. I read it to Andrew. And, do you know, the same thing still came at me. The same, so why, why don't you just smoke weed? Why don't you just be depressed? Why don't you just cry all day? Why don't you just stay in bed? Why don't this happen? Why um, I had to choose to draw on the power inside of me and say, I'm not going to. As much as I feel like it, as much as my head might hurt, as much as my body wants to do this, as much as I want to cry and break down, I'm not going to. And that's why I said at the beginning that I'm not in that place where I want to go and see Jesus. And I hope that while I'm alive on this earth, I never ever say those words that, oh, I can't wait to go and be with Jesus. Because I don't want to go and be with Jesus. I know he's with me now. I'll go to be with him one day and it'll be awesome. But my life on this earth can be amazing. Even if everything falls apart. Even if me and Andrew don't get on. Even if... We have no house to live, no money. My life can be absolutely amazing. It can be whatever God wants it to be, if I believe, if you believe. Your life can be anything God wants it to be, if you believe, because that power is inside of you. It's there, but we have to choose to draw on it. And you know, this today is Pentecost. <laughs> you know, the disciples received that power on that day. Now that power is available to everybody, absolutely everybody. And I know that, there's people, well, I don't know if there's anyone watching on live stream now, but I know that there may be people watching on live stream in the future. There may be now. So, you know, also for, for you in the room, because I don't know if there's anybody here that's not baptized in the Holy Spirit that doesn't speak in tongues. If there is, then that can be, that can be sorted out easily at the end of this service. But I want to say to the, the people on live stream, and I know we're going to run over a little bit, um, but I can't not do this bit, that, you know, to receive the Holy Spirit... It's simple. First, you have to be born again. You can't receive the Holy Spirit without being born again. You have to be born again. So if you're not born again, now I know I'm talking to, to those on live stream. So if you're not born again, then the Bible says that you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, which means that you believe that he's died for the sin of the world, that he's gone down to hell, that he's defeated the devil, that he has risen and he's seated next to God. And in doing that, he's made a way for you. If you believe that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, then you will be born again. So I just want to say a prayer that, you know, we can repeat it in this room. And then if there's anybody on live stream who wants to say that prayer or anybody in the future, if you're watching this a day, a month, 10 years from now, this is still relevant to you. So I'm going to say this prayer. It's a prayer of salvation. So it's a prayer that you pray if you want to be born again. So we're going to repeat it in the room, yeah, guys? Okay, so Father, I'm sorry for my sin. 
I believe Jesus has already paid for my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you are alive. That you now live in me. I am saved. I am forgiven. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So... If anybody, well, if anybody in that room wasn't born again, you are now. Um, but if anybody online prayed that prayer, if you pray it in the future, then you are born again now. There's um, a spiritual thing just happened inside of you. Your spirit just became born again and connected to God. So to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, all you do is ask. <laughs> all you do is ask. You say to God, do you know what, God? I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want the evidence of speaking in tongues. Don't, don't, you know, cut it short. Don't just say, I'll have the baptism. And if I speak in tongues, that's okay. You know, you, you know, when you make a demand on God, he gives. Well, he's already given, do you know what I mean? But when you make a demand on him, that's what we're supposed to do, you know. We're not supposed to be like, oh, God, you know, if it be we all will. It is his will. So we say, God, I want it. Give it to me. <laughs> that's what you say. You say, you know, this is what I mean, though, you know. You can do it, you know, there's many different ways, churches, denominations, the way people do things. But, you know, very simply, the day that I got born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, I wasn't following the rules. I didn't come to that place, you know, all holy and, you know, wearing my best clothes and made sure that I'd been good. I came to that place in a mess, you know, high on weed and wanting to kill myself. But God didn't withhold. I got born again. He poured out the Holy Spirit on me. And I didn't say it in a special way. You know, I was just like, well, give it to me then. I was like, I want it. That, that was it. Do you know what I mean? That's what he does. So you just ask him. So, Andrew, I don't know if you want to come back up now. Um, I know the, the worship team made up of Tegan just entered the room. Tegan, if you want to come back to the front as well, please. Um, we're not going to start worship straight away because I did want to just say to the people on live stream, and to anybody in this room. So if you're in this room and you don't speak in tongues, you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, at the end of this service, we want you to come to the front because God, you know, he doesn't withhold. He has good things for you. He's not withholding. So if you're in this room, then we're going to do that at the end. Now, if you're on live stream and you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, now, do you know, when I stood up here, yeah, if I'd have just opened my mouth and waited for God to speak, do you think I would have made a noise? If I'd have just gone? Nope. Probably wouldn't have worked, no? I had to talk, didn't I? It's the same with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, yeah? When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues, yeah? God doesn't force it out your mouth. You've got to open your mouth and you've got to make a noise. And you've got to believe that he will inspire your words. So the same way that when I stand up here and I pray, yeah? I don't write a prayer down beforehand. I just say... Father, and then it flows because the Holy Spirit inspires your words. It's the same with speaking in tongues, but you've got to make a noise because you can't just stand there. God doesn't force the words out, yeah? So those of you on live stream, I'm saying that to you as well. So, do you know, I really believe that it is simple. Do you know, I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, and I know that I know that I'm going to pray now and that anybody on live stream who is born again and wants to receive the Holy Spirit, as I say this prayer, you will receive the Holy Spirit. You will receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You know, the Bible actually says that believers will speak with new tongues. It says that. So should we say that in the room? I am a believer and I will speak in tongues. That's what the Bible says. So the, those of you on live stream, I am a believer and I will speak in tongues. So I'm just going to say a prayer now, okay? And it's for the people on live stream because we're going to pray for you guys if you want to be prayed for after the service. So, Father, I just thank you for the people watching on live stream. I thank you for their hearts. I thank you for their lives. I thank you that they, if they are born again, they are new creatures in Christ. I thank you that you've put your spirit within them. And... Father, right now, we just, we just pray that their hearts will be opened up. We just ask that you will pour out your spirit on them, that they will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit will enter into them and will fill them up, that they will feel the Holy Spirit inside of them, and that the experience of speaking in tongues will come naturally, that they will open their mouths and you will fill it with words, words that communicate directly with you. And Father, I thank you that you are a giver of good gifts and you withhold nothing. So I thank you that, Father God, right now you are 
releasing your Holy Spirit on all of those that wish to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I thank you that you've poured out your Spirit. I thank you that people have received. I thank you that they are now baptized in the Holy Spirit, that they can now speak in tongues. Amen. So if you're on live stream, before we end this, uh, the live stream, I would say to you, if you've just responded to that or if you respond to that in the future, open your mouth now and start to make a noise and the Holy Spirit will fill it. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to hand over to Andrew and Tegan now. And when the service ends, if you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you do not speak in tongues, do not leave the room. Come to the front. Okay? Amen.